seven million acres, seven and a half million acres in the, in the Central Valley. Yeah, uh, Joe, as a staff person at Central Valley Board, if you saw a state water board map come out that was more generalized compared to specific data that you get through your regulatory program, would you then put on the brakes and re, uh, you know, reestablish new priorities for your regulatory oversight, which is the words from, from this? Or would you just go forward with the agriculture program you're developing? Well, and Clay can certainly jump in, but um, you know our board has adopted these orders, and I'm the program manager that's supposed to oversee implementation of these orders. So certainly, you know, absent uh, you know a state board uh, policy requiring us to uh, you know set aside our efforts in favor of whatever you all come up with, we would go forward in our own program uh, using the information that's generated by each of our coalitions uh, as we, you know, identify the high and low vulnerability areas and determine what the appropriate next steps are from a regulatory perspective. Yeah, so really the answer is no, and, um, but you could look at these generalized maps and you know, and, and you'll you'll get some information potentially for other sources outside of of your the areas that you know more information about. You know, I, what I heard loud and clear from um, the, the Rice Commission was, look, we're, we're going down the path of, of more specific information that this effort that the legislature set up, you know, really is in the spirit of of what they're trying to do. Um, you know, and so. I, I, the main concern I'm hearing is that they don't, we don't want to have, you know, layers of more requirements that come down out of this. You know, is there a way that between us and the regional boards that we can assure the regulated community that, you know, that that's not going to happen? That, that this, this effort with the high risk maps, which the legislature requires, isn't going to sidetrack existing regulatory programs and efforts that we can find an equivalent level of effort within our existing programs well and my own feeling is and I think Tim hinted at this is it gets to our unless we do it very carefully there could be mixed messages going out right and so we would be um, trying to wade through through that messaging uh, you know, so let's just say, for example, there were no state uh, board maps. I think for us, the messaging would be fairly clear. You know, we're going through this process. We're identifying these high and low vulnerability areas uh, uh, with respect to irrigated cropland. And so then it's fairly clear in our orders and what our approach is going to be. Um, there's a potential, I think, if we don't do this very carefully, that you know, on the one hand, we'll be signaling that there maybe isn't a problem, and on the other hand, saying, well, watch out, there could be a problem. Uh, so I think, well, I think we can do it, and I think Tim is suggesting that, you know, through a process of maybe further engagement and sort of working out the details, we could certainly figure out how to do that. Um, but I think it would be challenging. And I do want to say that there's value in doing the gross assessment to start with. You know, we did that ourselves. We just took readily available information. We looked at you know, the DPR groundwater protection areas, the state board vulnerability areas, nitrate data, and we said, okay, if you guys don't come up with anything better than this, this is what we would do. And they said, well, we don't like that. We're going to come up with something <laughs> better than that. And, and you know, I think the Eastside Coalition has said the same thing. So there's certainly value in terms of motivating everybody to say, hey, maybe we've got better information or we can develop better information or refine these sort of gross assessments. Let's go on and have the next coalition because I think it's going to be a contrast and so uh, that will help our conversation. Thank you. I would just add that we'll be providing uh, this board before the end of its business today uh, a printed report of our groundwater assessment for right. each of you and Tammy, since you've already got one, we'll let you keep the one you have. Thank you. <laughs> Tam has paper. Yes, it's a sign of how much I appreciate this report that I actually accepted it in paper format. So we're joined now by the East San Joaquin Valley Coalition, Perry Claussen, and with Ludorf and Scalamini, um, Vicki Kretzinger. 
Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. My name is Perry Clausen. I'm the executive director of the East San Joaquin Water Quality Coalition. And um, before we go into groundwater, I just want you to gaze at the snow in the Sierra Nevadas for a moment. This was my photo from my farm on Saturday morning. I just had to stare at the snow and say, thank you, snow. So we're going to have a little bit of water, in, at least in the, some parts of the valley. Okay, let me get the clicker here. The downside about following Tim Johnson is that he always steals my thunder. He said everything. Can I say ditto Tim Johnson and all the comments that he made? So I won't need to repeat them. I will, I will minimize those repeating comments. But Tim, I think, is, is reflecting what we in the coalitions believe when we first heard about this map being developed. Uh, mixed messages is probably the understatement because the state board, of course, has, has a lot of authority and a lot of credibility in the outside. Uh, of the regulated community, and we, we certainly don't want to see this go forward at a time when nitrates in groundwater and the legislature are so keenly aware of what's going on and what needs to happen. So I think that's a, a, a reoccurring theme that you're going to hear throughout this, uh, these presentations. Now just to familiarize you with our coalition, just here's, here's a few of the statistics we have on our group. We have about 715,000 acres. We have a million acres of irrigated cropland in the area you see highlighted. We're managed by a board of directors. We're a standalone organization uh, formed wholly to be in compliance with the Irrigated Lands Program. We started in 2003. Our members are dues-paying members. They support our program that now has risen to $3.1 million in 2014 for both surface and groundwater programs. We too, like the Rice Commission, has spent a quarter million dollars to develop a very uh, robust plan, uh, a quality um, groundwater assessment report. And we think that uh, the information that we've developed is, is going to be useful in, in, uh, in a lot of different ways. And of course, I always have to mention, because my members might be in the audience, that dues also pays the state fee of 75 cents per acre. So just to give you, orient you in the geography of the East San Joaquin Coalition, you see here um, a depth of groundwater map and more so for the geography. Our coalition stretches from Fresno, which is off the map at the bottom, from Madera, you see 99 across the center of the coalition with the, the uh, San Joaquin River there on the center. And what this map I, I like to use because it illustrates the diversity in our depth to groundwater, which has a lot to do with our vulnerability and the types of farming and soils we have in our area. The darker colors being the deeper, uh, deeper to the groundwater versus the near the river areas where we can be from 10 to 20 feet to almost at the surface uh, depth to groundwater. And that has uh, quite a bit to do with the, the numbers that we found uh, as we went through this groundwater assessment report. Uh, our GAR is, is, as Joe described, uh, we want to establish the current groundwater quality in our basin, evaluate the impact of irrigated ag on that groundwater quality, and provide a scientifically based method to evaluate the vulnerabilities in these areas. Uh, we appreciate the earlier maps. Like Joe said, they, we, were, we were given DPR and state boards vulnerability and said, this is what you're going to use unless you come up with something better. And I think we've come up with a really good, uh, the consultants have come up with a very good approach that has uh, given us the information we need. And then as, as all of these GARs are going to be doing, they are going to identify and help us prioritize the areas for future groundwater management plans. We have massive areas, a million acres just in our coalition alone. We can't do everything tomorrow coming out of the gate, so we definitely need to prioritize. And as Vicki will be taking over in a minute, she's with Ludor Scalmanini Consulting Engineers and is hired to do our work. So uh, in our uh, report, I'll go over this really briefly, though. We, we will have, uh, we have groundwater levels, and I, I'll just stop for a second. We submitted our proposed plan to the regional board. We have not gotten any feedback yet, and we've not gone through what Tim has gone through with his groundwater assessment report. So we're, we're presenting to you what we propose to the regional board. So anyway, we've got maps on the land use, groundwater quality, uh, a groundwater vulnerability assessment approach that determines these high vulnerabilities uh, areas, as well as doing a, a massive data analysis to identify wells with these nitrate exceedances uh, in the last, at least in the last 10 years and maybe more in some. And then uh, we're, we're also going to show you some maps where we're proposing to prioritize some of these high vulnerability areas. And then it serves as all the groundwater assessment reports from the coalitions, the basis for our trend monitoring network, which was, will be where we will be monitoring uh, throughout our regions from here going forward for a long time. 
So we will be identifying these candidate sites proposing to the regional board. So just real quickly, some maps. Here's the depths of groundwater. It's similar to what I showed you before. The, the, the lighter areas are the shallower groundwater near the river, whereas the, uh, the, the darker areas are shallower, whereas the lighter areas are our deeper areas. Pretty much all of our region is irrigated agriculture. The white is primarily the cities, and the, uh, the green line is the border of the, the, uh, the lower part of the Sierra Nevada. Some of that is uh, non-irrigated pasture in white, and then, of course, the cities. And there are some grasslands right along the uh, wetlands that you see right along the river that are not irrigated at this time. Our land use is very mixed from an irrigated ag standpoint. You can see the variation in colors and the, the key on the left. A lot of grapes in the south in Madera County, transitions to trees in the central and northern parts. And then on the, the east or the western part of our coalition, uh, a lot of uh, multi-crop, double cropping with, the, with dairy silage and other types of crops. And then the irrigation practices, this is in 2000. I suspect that we have a lot more purple going on now since the conversion to micro and drips irrigation. We have a substantial portion of our acreage that is in drip irrigation, especially in the areas if you overlaid the crops would be where the trees and vines are. A substantial amount of uh, drip and micro systems using. And then very importantly for vulnerability is the, the groundwater recharge areas. These are soils that are coarser, tend to be on the river plains. Uh, as you can see on the very top, Stanislaw River, Tuolumne River, uh, Merced River, and then a couple of the waterways in Madera County towards the bottom. Most of those you can see in blue, and those are the areas with, uh, that, that have um, recharge of groundwater. So the data that we are reviewing are used in this, uh, public accessible, similar to what Tim Johnson and the Rice Commission use, uh, both groundwater quality and the levels. Uh, we did get some data from our local irrigation districts and other entities, and uh, also a focus on nitrates, TDS, and pesticides, not just nitrates. And we did have, as you see, over 6,500 wells with nitrate detections, and uh, some also some reconnaissance summaries and other constituents were done in this, in this area. So here is our nitrate information. You can see the numbers are the colors, the, the, the uh, reddish, the hotter colors are the higher nitrate areas. We definitely have some issues in our coalition region with high nitrates from a variety of sources. Uh, this um, vul vulnerability designation well, it considers the hydrologic characterization, uh, characteristics, the observed groundwater quality, the land use, and the scientific quantitative approach. These, uh, Vicki will go into details how these, these are all combined together to come up with approach. We also did compare this to what the State Water Board, this approach to State Water Board and California Department of Pesticide Regulation. I'm going to show you this just quickly. This is just State Board uh, designations, not from the most current effort, but uh, from the past effort the State Board has done along with our groundwater protection areas from DPR. Uh, the brown is groundwater protection, whereas the blue is both uh, runoff and, or, or is the runoff areas for surface water. Uh, so we came up with this vulnerability designation. Um, as I would have to admit, and you can see from this, most of our area is high vulnerability. The, the darker or the lighter brown are what, what we are proposing as high vulnerability areas. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. We've got uh, two, you see four areas, A, B, C, D, and E, I guess five areas, six areas. Uh, to the E and F are pretty small, but these are areas where we are going to, we propose they be high vulnerability with the ability to go back and refine the data and information to possibly move them over into high vulnerability areas. So. The other thing, too, is we mentioned is our prioritization. We, we in consultation with a regional board, are going to propose that our, vul that our priority areas in our vulnerability be up gradient primarily of drinking water supplies for the major metropolitan areas and the smaller cities. Uh, you can see those, number one, are Merced, Madera, and, and Modesto, as well as some of the smaller areas. These are, of course, concern uh, for, for management pr plans that we will be putting together here in the next few months. But these, these are the maps uh, that we've come up with so far, proposed to the regional board, and we're waiting with bated breath to hear what staff has to say about them. So I will turn this over to Vicki. Vicki, before you get started, I just want to make sure, uh, you're going to have to uh, be leaving. Oh, okay. Uh, no, I think we'll, it'll be about a quarter of 12. Okay. Never mind. Go ahead. 
Good morning. Thank you very much. I'm Vicki Kretzinger with Ludorf and Scalmanini Consulting Engineers, and I'll kind of go back over what Carrie and Perry just breezed through and cover a few more details about the vulnerability analysis in particular. So as both uh, Joe and Perry have mentioned, we had the option as presented in the WDR to consider the State Water Board's mapping that was initially done in 2000 and updated in 2011 with a literature survey, and then also uh, DPR's mapping that was a, a more quantitative approach, but it was directed at depth to water and soil permeability as related to pesticide occurrences. So we wanted to look specifically at the conditions in the East San Joaquin Water Quality Coalition area and determined a quantitative way to approach the determination of vulnerability. And there is no guidance in the WDR as to how to distinguish between high and low, so that was another challenge before us. Our focus was on the, the hydrogeology, but it also considered land use as a control factor. And we looked at land uses, not only what Perry showed a moment ago, 2012, but it was also important to look at earlier mapping from the mid-90s and the early 2000s. And we did many statistical models. So there were multiple regression statistical models, numerous hydrogeologic parameters, including soil hydraulic conductivity and slope, the presence of the Corcoran clay, the depth of the Corcoran clay, the thickness of the Corcoran clay, many things all feeding into what would constitute hydrogeologic sensitivity and the opportunity for impact from land use to result in an occurrence of elevated nitrate concentrations. And so as we did this, uh, we looked at how these models performed and we related them to our physical conceptualization, our understanding of the hydrogeology of the area and what the concentrations were. And we tested these models relative to both nitrate um, at over the MCL and also at above half the MCL or five milligrams per liter. And then later, uh, once we selected the best performing model, we also compared the results to pesticide occurrences. So in the next uh, few slides, I'm going to walk through the comparison of what uh, Perry showed a snapshot of, the vulnerability area that we ended up with, and then how that relates to the DPR and state water board areas, and then the occurrence of nitrate and also the occurrence of pesticides. So um, on the vulnerability determination, the area that's colored is the area of prevalent groundwater basin within the East San Joaquin Water Coalition area. The only other basin within the watershed is in Yosemite Valley, and it's a, a not an irrigated lands area. So this became our focus on the Central Valley floor. And once we selected the model, which is referred to here as shallow wells groundwater vulnerability model, and this meant that it was looking at um, information for less than 200 feet in the system but when we went about comparing that to nitrate occurrences, we related it to all occurrences of nitrate. So that was detections from more than 6,500 wells at all depths, shallow, deep, and, and unknown well depths. So we took the equation developed within this model, we applied that equation to every cell, every 30 meter square cell across the entire Central Valley floor, to establish a relative vulnerability. So the color scheme shows in the very warmest colors the, the higher vulnerability to the very lowest in the, the greenest color scheme. So as I mentioned a moment ago, there is no specific formula as to how we would go about determining high versus low. So that became an important thing in that the test became looking at our ability to, to capture, so to speak, within a vulnerability designation uh, the most of the nitrate occurrences. So when we landed on this footprint that sh Perry showed a moment ago, this captured most and there were some areas, six areas, that fell outside of what we had a, a hydrogeologic based equation, scientific quantitative approach to designate. And these are areas that didn't directly conform to when we looked at the hydrogeology and the land use and the resultant water quality. An example is the area D, which is at the southernmost um, boundary of the coalition. And this is an area also of the Madeira Ranchos. So this is an example of an area that has not only four uh, su supply wells that had exceedances, but also other wells that did not exceed nitrate 
uh, MCL. And even amongst the four wells that had exceedances, uh, most three of those only had exceeded it once or twice, and then uh, often it did not exceed it. There was only one well that it exceeded it many times. So this brings to the, I guess, um, consideration, you know, are there other sources? Uh, the point is to look at irrigated lands under this regulatory program, but there are other factors that could be involved, including other sources of nitrate. So here, with this uh, model, we had captured 98% of the nitrate that had exceedances. So there were 1,444 wells with nitrate exceedances. 98% of those fall within this footprint of high vulnerability. 2% were in these designated tentative high vulnerability areas. Uh, conservatively, for the time being, we're referring to the total vulnerability area uh, captured. This is a comparison now between what the State Water Board has mapped as hydrogeologically vulnerable areas in the purple shade, and then DPR in the blue shade, and East San Joaquin in the brown shade. We have a, uh, the, the greatest discrepancy between mapped areas between the State Water Board purple areas and, and DPRs and East San Joaquin's high vulnerability area. DPR um, matches more closely in the north part of the coalition area, but to the south, um, and this is where, as you may recall from the slide Perry showed, DPR has mapped this as the runoff area. So DPR refers to both leaching and runoff areas, or the combination of both as groundwater protection areas. So this is where there's a, a discrepancy between the mapped areas. I'm going to show next a couple of tables, and, and this sums up um, the comparison of the East San Joaquin high vulnerability area to the State Water Board and DPR areas and the, and the coincident combined uh, areas for State Board and DPR. So as we see here, we have the East San Joaquin, as I mentioned, 98% capture. State Water Board only 21% capture of nitrate uh, wells with exceedances. DPR 71%. Um, the combined area captures a, a better, coincidentally, 82, but not because of the mapped areas, but because of the divergence of the mapped areas. And pesticides, this is the one that we did not use during the formulation of the model, but it was used to then uh, check the results of how we did in a constituent other than just nitrate. As Joe mentioned, other constituents are being looked at, not only exceedances of nitrate concentrations. So here, East San Joaquin, the, the footprint covers 100% of the 367 wells that had exceedances. Now this is over 2,700 wells with detections, 48 pesticides detected, eight pesticides that had exceedances of either a MCL, of which there are not very many, or water quality objectives. And so compared to East San Joaquin, State Water Board had 69% capture of pesticides, DPR 66%, and together those areas did better at 92%. And Perry mentioned also that then we went about ranking um, within the high vulnerability area. So all of the high vulnerability area, we then created an involved matrix uh, that we wanted to calculate to quantify a rel the relative priority of how things would be addressed within the high vulnerability area. As it's, uh, Perry mentioned, it's quite a large area. So as they go forward in, in meeting other WDR requirements, there's a lot to do. And so we put together a, a matrix um, on this slide. There are a few of the parameters on this matrix, but not, not nearly all of them. Some of the things involve the groundwater quality conditions. So not only that there were exceedances, but also trends, either improving or degrading. And the number of detections, uh, the density of detections, the land use and uh, typical nitrogen application rates and irrigation methods associated with commodities. Now this is only based on uh, available information at this time. It does not involve what the coalition is about to embark on as a result of the WDR requirement to more specifically look at uh, field specific nitrogen application rates and irrigation methods. And then another uh, factor was the proximity to public su uh, water supply wells. So this is the resultant high um, vulnerability priority areas. 
And here again, it's um, for each and every 30 meter square cell, it's given a value based on all of these parameters. And based on that value, then there's an aggregation of those that constitute uh, relatively higher and l less high uh, within the high, prior uh, high vulnerability area. And so to sum up, um, the East San Joaquin high vulnerability area does well in capturing the nitrates um, better compared to state water board and DPR areas for purposes of the irrigated lands regulatory program. And similarly with pesticides, it does very well with respect to the capture of exceedances compared to the other areas. So overall, uh, we have a, a science-based foundational document for the coalition to use as it goes forward to meet its other requirements under the WDR. And there are also the six tentative areas to be further considered as the coalition wishes to, to try and identify what um, reasonably belongs within the irrigated lands regulatory program or if the source is from another other than irrigated lands um, source. And as it's been mentioned multiple occasions this morning, uh, we did identify the need for better data uh, would help even uh, refine the resolution beyond what we were able to accomplish. Thank you. We will we will be breaking at a quarter of twelve. So and I know Didi's not going to be back with us, uh, possibly not back uh, after when we come back uh, at one fifteen. Uh, so why don't we start with you if you have questions. Well, uh, our comments. I, I, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, this is really important to me, and I regret that I'm not going to be able to be here for this afternoon. So just want to uh, uh, let the stakeholders know, please, um, I will do, the, first of all, I will do the best I can to get caught up. And secondly, uh, my door's open to any of you who would like to uh, meet with me to discuss this further. I think this kind of cries out for workshop or further discussion. Um, there are a lot of uh, different approaches here. Uh, I will say that um, I, I like where the coalitions are headed. I think that that's, that provides um, more specific information, but at the same time very concerned about areas that aren't covered and the need to get the word out um, to communities um, Maybe they need to do some further testing or seek out some assistance, you know, from other sources on their own. So those are just very general comments. I have a lot of uh, faith in our staff. I know that they've been working hard on this and been working with the regions. So I'm sure that it can be worked out. Um, one other alternative is just in the meantime, with all these different approaches, I know it's hard for a disadvantaged community that doesn't have the capacity to be able to, you know, uh, go through and figure out how to use this information, but just uh, to put it out there as we have um, in the meantime, uh, even if there's not a map, there are a lot of maps that uh, can provide useful information and uh, maybe there's some other approach that no one's even thought of so far uh, by virtue of the fact that getting that information out. So um, one thing that uh, Michael reminded me of and that I think makes a lot of sense is that we have um, um, the, our approach in the past has spurred folks on to do more specifics and um, doing something like cutting out the areas that have a specific one and referring them to that. Mm -hmm. And so you may have the uh, uh, statewide map but it has blank areas that refer it or cross hatched or mm -hmm. solid black or whatever, you know, whatever we decide um, between us might be a way to, um, to refer people to the more specific areas where those are available without um, denying the folks that are outside of the more specific areas and it provides some um, spur and incentive to move forward with mm -hmm. more specific information. It's one thing for us to think about. I will remind the board that this is an information item for us to just start, you know, the discussion with you all and making sure that we're thinking about all the right things that are of concern to you as we move forward. And I understand there are two comment cards, which I would hate to have people have to stay, <laughs> uh, have to come back afterwards, particularly if we're going to continue this conversation. So let's, uh, we'll go ahead and do the two comment cards, and then we'll get back to, uh, to you, John. Uh, first is John Herrick, and second is Laurel Firestone, so you can be ready. 
Thank you, Madam Chairman, uh, board members, John Herrick for South Delta Water Agency. Uh, I'd like to agree with what the coalitions have put on today. There's a lot of effort being done. Our Delta San Joaquin coalition is also undertaking to begin its uh, groundwater assessment report before the WDR is passed. So we're encountering these same things. Uh, the point I want to make, and I'll try to be brief here, is that I don't think you have the basis for deciding upon what sort of map you will release to the public and say, we believe these are risky areas. And that's because of what both the coalitions have said and what our coalition is going through. You don't know. Um, as we go through this, we've had the exact same um, results as the other coalitions. When we look at the uh, previous state board risk area maps or maps of risk, they don't coincide with where we find problems. And the Department of uh, Pesticide Regulation maps partially correspond to where we found problems. Now that's our beginning point. Now we've got this huge amount of data that we have to go through. Some things have to be separated out. You know, there are there are places that are subject to cleanup orders that have. You know, there was a, um, a, a fertilizer company in Ripon that's being cleaned up over a 30-year period or something like that. You know, and there, those are some of the hits. So we got to get those out. We found that, you know, you can make an analysis and say, okay. Uh, where there are trees, there's a higher likelihood, and then you go to another area where there are trees and there's no hits. So there's a whole huge process of trying to define um, the criteria by which you make a decision, and we haven't even gotten to that point yet. That's not to say the Eastern San Joaquin uh, Coalition hasn't done a wonderful job. They had to make some good decisions. I believe they have. We're going through that thing. The last thing on earth we want is to have the State Board release maps that draw large gross areas because contrary to the good intentions of Joe, a good friend of mine, uh, we will then have to spend more money to argue with the regional board as to why what we've done is not in agreement with that. So I wouldn't want to um, lessen the message you're trying to give to the public, but there has to be a different way to say, um, if you're concerned about nitrates in the groundwater, here's, a, here's the area or something. It cannot be based upon these, no offense, coarse maps based upon limited criteria, and they are based upon limited criteria, the old state board and the DPR maps. Y you don't have the information yet to decide what map to use. We're trying to do those, and then we'll fight with the regional board because we'll turn it in and they'll say, that's good, but we think the rest of your coalition should be high vulnerability anyway. No, I don't mean that badly. I just mean that's how the process works. So, so anyway, I encourage you not to adopt the maps. If you want to have a workshop and go over this, see maybe we can jointly come up with something that can be released to convey the concern, um, I would support that. But I'm urging you not to um, release these maps. Don't, don't leave, John, if I could ask a, a question. Maybe the, the concern, I, is the concern, the use of the term high risk. Um, to me, you know, high risk means you've done some analysis and assessment, and based on the data, you've determined that these are high risk. What if, for example, some of the maps that staff has drafted, they're simply labeled as to what they are, meaning these are the areas where, you know, over half the MCL was exceeded without trying to interpret it as either high risk or low risk, but it is what it is. It's, it's the data that we currently have being presented in a graphical format. I, I think I agree with that. Now, again, I'm not trying to waste time, but upon reflection, we, you know, I might Answering have a my question is never a waste of time. No, no, no. <laughs> you know, upon reflection, I might try to come up with something different, but I agree completely. If you say, here's a map, and the dots constitute this, and then you have a warning at the bottom that says, this doesn't mean the areas around the maps are necessarily at risk. That's being determined, blah, blah, blah. But that's exactly correct. But you don't want something that says, the Central Valley is a high-risk area. And then, you know, everybody's upset. And when we go through these processes, we find areas of high risk and areas of no risk or you know, little risk or whatever, however we couch that. But I do agree the factual rather than the um, descriptive risk term should be used. Thank you very much. Laurel. Thank you. Uh, so I think there's a common theme that we need better data. Clearly, we all agree on all sides that we need better data. And that um, there's, there's two purposes here. There's trying to notify people where they are likely to potentially be drinking nitrate-contaminated water through private wells um, and where there's a high risk of 
groundwater source being contaminated with nitrate. And then there's a regulatory purpose looking at, you know, how, um, how might ongoing impacts be impacting nitrate. And there is a very involved process around the regulatory process. And there isn't a lot of efforts other than the state board around, um, you know, this initial map around nitrate exposure. I think that's a really important purpose. It's also a living, all of these things should be living documents and that we're we should be continuing to get new information and updating all of these maps as we get better data. I think the regulatory program and purpose is specific to irrigated ag, and that, of course, is not the only source of nitrate. Um, and it's also particularly focused at ongoing impacts and not necessarily historic ones, not that you're not looking at historic trends, but in terms of how you're prioritizing things, that's what, that's really the purpose of the regu the focus of the regulatory program. I think when the state board thinks about its purpose um, with maps identifying areas that are, where there's a high risk that you might be drinking nitrate, that is um, from drinking water sources and groundwater sources, that's a very different purpose and one that is a huge need to get out there. There's needs not just, I mean, particularly with funding programs and also providing priorities within planning, regional and local planning processes to, to identify this. Um, I will say there are efforts going on right now around developing better um, indicators of what people are drinking and um, around the state and the quality of water that people are drinking around the state. And so I'd be happy and would love to follow up with folks on those efforts um, and how those fit in. But I, I will say it should be a a living document that can be updated. We should be making sure that we're collecting more information. My concern with some of the maps are where one of the questions early on was, would it be better to put up a map that's just the raw data points versus some interpretation? And, you know, there's there are huge data gaps, and the biggest data gaps are those communities on private wells or areas that are private wells where you don't have um, bigger, larger municipal systems. And that's where you're, you um, are, have the biggest data gaps or where there's not regulatory programs in place yet that are requiring private well testing or existing well testing. Um, and so I don't, I, my concern is if you're just putting the data points up, if you have a white area, it looks like there's not a problem, but it's really that there's no data. And I think you may be sending the wrong message. I think there should be some interpretation, um, you know, and it, it, that I fully agree that that should be a, a process um, for making sure that it's the best interpretation out there. But, but I, it's not, I don't think it's adequate just to do um, the existing data. The other points I wanted to mention are, um, you know, within, we, we've made a, um, some comments um, informally around the groundwater assessment process with the, the regulatory program. I think um, one of the data things that aren't there is um, even where communities are that are on private wells or on very small systems that, that is hard for the consultants and coalitions to build into their analysis. And so I think, um, but it's really key if we're gonna prioritize areas that those are the ones that are most vulnerable. And so we need to make sure that we're not just prioritizing areas around the big municipalities, but areas where people are reliant on private wells um, in particular are the most vulnerable to groundwater contamination. Um, and, uh, and, but that's really more of a comment around how things are prioritized within the regulatory programs so with the irrigated ag. Um, and then uh, lastly, I would just say, I, um, I, just, I think it's really important to note that many of the, the data that is available to inform all of this is either solely from things like the regulatory program at the regional board on the dairies that's requiring um, a huge amount of additional um, groundwater testing, and Gamma has done that in particular uh, counties, but there's really limited out there, and I, I would just encourage the board to make sure that, you know, similar to recommendations around um, that the governor's stakeholder group um, recommended around the small state smalls and local wells, um, and even, uh, and, and also just within the regulatory programs that 
are um, overseen by this board is just to think about how we can make sure that we're getting more and more data on existing water quality into a database that's usable with good quality um, so that we can all have a much better characterization and understanding of the groundwater that we're relying on. Thanks. Now, John, you're under pressure. How much more time do you need? Perry, and do and, and board members, do you have questions that you want to follow up after lunch? So Darren's going to speak for maybe five minutes, if that, and then Perry said he has ten minutes. Then can we come back? Are you able to come back at uh, 115? He, he can't. It's, you um, think you could do it in seven minutes? Well, then I, I have to leave because I have to go. Karen, <laughs> can you come up? Like, what do you need? Two minutes? We can do it in nine minutes. <laughs> well, and I just okay. I want to we, we just we just okay. Go point ahead. out one item to the board, and I you know obviously this is an informational item. Right. I don't know if you have any questions because I believe you have to leave. Is that correct? I I, I, I have to leave. Uh, I have to be at the governor's office yeah. at, at noon. So <laughs> the board can continue in your absence. Okay. Perfect. And it, the board won't have a quorum during that point. And obviously, the videotape will be available if you want to refer back to hear the okay. remainder of the presentation. It's not ideal, but okay. I leave this in. Tam's capable hands, and I delegate to Stephen. <laughs> and 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 we uh, uh, we will reconvene at one fifteen to hear item ten. All right. Well, uh, well, let's continue, and uh, but let's target. I just heard fifteen minutes, so let's try to to wrap we up. We by could, we would hold it down to nine. Okay, let's try to wrap up. Uh, Great job, uh, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, and Darren, can you take it away, please? I'll get you one. Or it was Perry. <laughs> okay, Darren. So Darren Paulham is Deputy Director, Division of Administrative Services here, but uh, working on a lot of ag issues in Region 3 voted me most popular to present their viewpoint, I guess, since I've uh, had a lot of experience with them. And obviously, I worked with the John's group and the Snake Water group. So um, they just had a couple things they wanted to basically say. And then um, Perry and I haven't coordinated, but he'll follow up, I, I'm pretty sure, with what the uh, monitoring that is going on there under the Central Coast order. So um, basically, uh, Region 3's main points were, as they wanted to emphasize, as everybody knows, that their program is focused on safe drinking water. And that's kind of paramount in their thinking for their irrigated lands program. Um, when they look at the statewide maps that were done uh, by the group that were first presented uh, to you, um, I think a couple things come to light. That is that when you look at the lower Salinas Valley, uh, a major portion of the Santa Maria uh, agricultural areas, that there was kind of no matter which map you picked, evidence of high impacts of nitrate, um, both on just the data sets or high vulnerability maps or whatever. So kind of from their perspective, that, that highlights that. Um, for those particular areas, it's a, it's a broadly impacted area. Um, obviously, they have their order in place that does have groundwater monitoring, which I believe Perry will uh, cover. So they kind of feel it, that it just validated that what they have going forward is kind of an initial step and will be modified, but does address those areas of a particular concern focused in, in those particular areas. So they didn't really have uh, much of a preference. If they were to choose, it was the orange map for color reference. Uh, it kind of highlighted both an overlay of data plus uh, vulnerability criteria that was done uh, by the State Board work group. Obviously, you've seen much more refined versions of that from the other coalitions, but it was, it was the first rough approach. And again, I think kind of from their particular circumstances, it, the distinction was minimal between kind of the different uh, avenues of approach. And, um, and that was pretty much it. From, from their standpoint, they're going to obviously continue to implement their order as um, amended by the board's petition and, and go forward. Thank you, Darren. Perry Kloss and I'm wearing my other hat, Executive Director of the Central Coast Groundwater Coalition. And our group is very young, very new, but we are, we are making traction in the Central Coast. We now have currently 194,000 acres and roughly 565 members that 
uh, represent irrigated agriculture in the Central Coast region. You see the counties listed there, pretty much from Santa Clara down to the northern tip of, of Ventura County are encompassed by our, our coalition region. We focus only on groundwater component of the irrigated lands program on the Central Coast, have nothing to do with surface water. So our, our goals and our mission is, is groundwater specific. Our membership is fairly well represented, as you see here in Salinas, uh, Salinas Valley, uh, Santa Clara, up in the Watsonville-Gilroy area, as well as Hollister. There's some around the Watsonville area, the, the strawberry country, and then as you get moved down south, San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, Santa Maria Valleys, we've got some pretty good representation of the landowners in, in that area as well. Just a real quick recap of what we've done. We started work in July. Uh, we started forming the group earlier in the year, but we got our plan approved in July, uh, st formed an organization in the, on the 13th. You all came in and did some modifications to our program in, in September, and we began sampling uh, drinking water wells and some irrigation wells in October. Uh, in the Salinas Valley, qu quickly followed behind with the addition of the southern counties in November, San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara counties with sampling there. And we started on November 26th contacting our members who had domestic wells that were above the drinking water standard. And then just still racing forward here in January, we completed our, at end of January, completed our South County individual sampling, which was part of the deal of getting the South Counties in as we had to pick up the, the requirements for those growers. And then uh, a couple of weeks ago began the Pajaro Valley characterization sampling. So I want to kind of separate the two in your minds. We have the individual requirements in the South, which was added on for bringing the South Counties in, but the characterization sampling we, were do we are doing in the northern areas based on our initially approved plan. So um, in March this month, we're continuing to notify our members who have nitrate exceedances indicated in their well sampling. Uh, we're beginning Gilles Gilroy Hollister. Uh, we will be finishing the South Counties in August and have our first uh, or complete sampling completed this fall. The reason I'm running through this is because we're really early on in our program. I, I want to give you an indication of what we're learning here, but I, I just keep in mind that this is a very young program. Uh, our final reports with, with the information that I'm going to describe are, are due March of 2015 for the North and June 2015 in the South. So our characterization uh, requirements are different from what is going on in the Central Valley in that we are focusing on domestic supply water, or the, the drinking water of farms and rural residences encompassed by our members. Uh, we're trying to determine the spatial vari variability of the groundwater quality and the, and the factors that are affecting those concentrations. So as we go about collecting this information, we also went to GeoTracker Gamma. We had some other studies done locally that we've, we've gathered this well information as well as going out. Uh, collecting samples from domestic and irrigation wells from our members, some of the shots that you see here. Uh, we will, at, at the end of this, be putting forward maps either on GeoTracker or on our website that show the information that, that is somewhat similar to what the State Board is trying to do in, in indicating where there is, there's high-risk areas. Now, somebody got hold of my slides, so bear with me while it does the magic stuff that isn't corresponding to my presentation. Okay, so the final report has contour maps. We, we are going to put forward, based on the depth to groundwater, contour maps that we think will help residences and others in these areas determine about what their levels of nitrates are to a pretty high degree of confidence. And uh, we're going to be taking into account the number of percentage of domestic wells and nitrate con concentrations above the MCL, the distribution of domestic wells uh, not regulated by the counties, but because the counties are currently regulating the, the five and uh, I believe it's five and larger connections. And then as, w as we are all challenged with, and I think this, is, this overlays with what the State Board is doing, when you talk about a drinking water well, it's very important for somebody to know what the depth of screen interval, the depth of the well and the screen interval depths, because that indicates the aquifer. So we are going to be developing these for the various levels of groundwater where extraction is taking place. A number is, is helpful if it's the same depth of well that you are being uh, drawing water from. If it's different depths, it can have entirely different results. 
So when we go out and do our analysis, uh, what we have been doing now is, is primarily nitrates and, and some of the other ions uh, that you see listed here. We are doing in addition some isotope uh, sampling to try to determine some of the sources and the ages of the water. This is not in our order, but something that we're doing for source identification. We're also doing some pharmaceuticals to see if we can uh, indicate any, any uh, potential septic uh, influence. And also, as you see here, the age of the water and, and some of the source of water is going forward. Just to Get a, give us a better characterization of our area. So this characterization covers the items that you see here. I won't go through them in, in a period of time, but you, the, the, the characterization that we're going to be submitting to the regional board that you will have access to will have all of these, these, these points here uh, indicated. And then going forward, the future, future monitoring in the annual re uh, reports that we do will build into this information that, that we have provided. The challenge is, we can only look at the aquifers we have data for, obviously. We're only sampling our members in these areas uh, who are in the irrigated lands program, and then we are still having the challenge of getting that well construction information. That's very important for the characterization. But again, back to our contours, the idea with this is we will take a, a, a depth of groundwater, contour those levels, as you see here indicated, so you have the 10 and the 5, so if you put your clicker right in the middle, we will have f put forward what we feel with at least 90 percent probability that you're going to have about a seven milligram per liter sample result. We think this is a very much better way than data points on a map because we don't you don't always have a data point that you can correlate your well to accurately. So we feel that this can do a couple of things. It gives a lot more information. To, to someone to, to trigger whether or not they should sample, but we also intend to use this to justify why in certain areas we don't need to go sample a well. If it's clearly an exceedance around in, in the contours, it's kind of a waste of money to go in that area for our characterization. So we, we have run this, this approach on one of our sub-basins, this uh, Monterey Bay you see on the north there at Salinas Valley stretching to the south. Uh, we took some 79 wells, uh, b not only our sampling, but Gamma GeoTracker. We used averages from wells uh, that we were sampling, excluded wells from the urban area, came up with this, this beginning draft contouring of that particular patch that I showed you in the previous slide. What we did find in the, is that some of the data is not as robust as we might like, so we are going to be, go back and do additional sampling to fill in those gaps so we, are, we have that 90 percent confidence level that, that we have committed to, to providing. And we did some, some predicted uh, amount of, of nitrates that we would see, and it pretty much matched what we thought we, what we actually found when we out, went out and did sampling. A few outliers, but generally we predicted, we found what we predicted would be the case in that east side uh, study area so far. So what, uh, what we're going to be doing is continuing this in all those sub-basins that you saw in that one map, uh, determine whether we need some more additional sampling, and then evaluate the distribution in light of the other data, this well depths, geology, land use, depth of groundwater and such. Very important for, for groundwater aquifers. And then um, let's see, that we, have, we have some lists due for our additional sampling, and then uh, also going to be looking at this, uh, the data that we do uh, on this, these uh, age dating nitrate isotopes to try to determine source. And this, our first technical memorandum is due um, at the end of April. Just real quick, because you guys got us into this business of groundwater sampling in the south, we in four months have sampled 653 wells. Uh, we have developed notification systems uh, setups for our members. Uh, we are on the process of doing this notification now and also doing the follow-up. And we are finding that growers are responding to the fact that if we find high nitrates, they are responding. Uh, this is just a, you can come back to this. This is our process that we use for notification. Most significantly, though, our first round, and we've done six rounds now, we call a week of sampling a round, and we've gone through approximately six rounds. Of the 17 members were 33 wells. Every one of them responded back to us. Every one of them provided some sort of replacement water. Uh, they reported to us either bottled water uh, either, or discontinued use of the well, used reverse osmosis filtration. So we, we use this or show this to you to, to, to indicate to you that these growers are, are responding to the information they are provided. And we, as we anticipated, they are very concerned about when there is a well that has drinking water, um, nitrates above the drinking water standard. I almost made nine minutes. No, you did quite well. I think maybe 13 or so. But thank okay. you, Perry. <laughs>
<laughs> Excellent. And and thank you, Darren, for the, the quick overview. And it's good to hear from the Central Coast region about, you know, all the activity and the responsiveness and uh, work getting done. So thanks for that quick update. Um, I'll look to Tam if she's got any questions or opinions to give staff on this item. Or I think I will we'll just um, concur with DD's remarks before she left and ask um, for staff to work with the coalition members to work with those who spoke today and um, come back to us with um, perhaps some suggestions on how we might, how you propose uh, to present the information, whether it be in two different kinds of maps or whatnot, so that um, it is as clear as possible as to what data is being presented um, and what analysis, if any, is reflected in those maps. Mm -hmm. Good. And do you have any response to that? Or? Well, I, I think we actually heard a lot of um, uh, uh, good information that sparked a lot of thoughts that um, I'll be working with staff on and talking with the, um, with the stakeholders and, of course, the regents. Well, that's that's excellent. Yeah, I thought just for my part, I, I heard um, you know that this is going to be useful if it's a living document. Um, uh, Jonathan and Michael, you point out that you know the intent behind uh, our recommendations in the SBX 21 report was to spur on more specific in, uh, management and monitoring and, and and scientific information. We learned that sometimes the course approach uh, gets us kind of close to the fine approach. Sometimes we miss the mark entirely right so we there's a need perhaps to manage expectations coming in that certainly we want this to have be good information to assist local communities to help make decisions to inform the public about the risk to drinking water and maybe that's that could be highlighted you know let's just prove food for thought that this is for assistance and, but then when we talk about using this for regulatory oversight we really want to recognize existing regulatory programs underway uh, because it would not be our intent to create a duplicative set of requirements but actually spur on that more refined uh, local and regional management and understanding and communication to the public so with that uh, it sounds like uh, we heard a lot of great information. Staff's going to take it into consideration very seriously, and uh, we'll be in touch with, with uh, everyone who has a big interest in this outcome. Thank you. With that, we'll be adjourned until 1.15.